this morning. This week we're talking about love. Um, we've been talking about love for a while. This is arguably one of the most important topics to understand as a Christian. Because if you don't understand love, you can't fulfill the two greatest commandments that Jesus taught us to do, which is love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. And he says all of the other commandments, every single one of them can fall into those two. And it, it, Even that statement alone is interesting to think about. Jesus said all the other commandments can fit into two. How is that possible? How is it possible that love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as you love yourself, fits into all the commandments we're supposed to follow. It's really easy. Because when we love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, we're obedient to the Lord. Which means that every other commandment falls into that one. And some of those commandments are talking about how we treat our neighbors. Right? So every single commandment that we walk by, every commandment that God has given us to, to, to walk in, in the spirit, to walk the way God has asked us to walk, falls into those two. So today we're going to be looking at what is love. Um, we did do a sermon on the four different kinds and where they're found in scripture. I'm not going to go over that because I spent a whole sermon on it. If you want to know how many of the different kinds of love used in uh, the Greek language were actually used in scripture then feel free to go back to our first sermon. Otherwise, we're going to just jump right into this. But I do want to bring to your remembrance that agape and agapeo are by far the most used words for love in Scripture. So just for, I will reference this, agape is found 116 times. It is considered a divine love. It's considered a preferential love. God, when it says that God so loved the world, God so preferred the world. What does it mean to prefer? It means that if I hold two things up against each other, there is a preference for one over the other. Okay. If you were to offer me water or coffee, my preference would be water. Sorry to all you coffee drinkers. Oh, I know. It's like coffee blasphemy. But no, so the, prefer the preference is when you prefer something over another. This is important to remember because the preferential love of God means that he had a preference for us. This is, this is a beautiful picture. The other side is, I don't, I'm not going to get into it because we already talked about it. The other one is agapeo. Agapeo is, is love through obedience. It's love in a way that lets, that you are Forming to who God called you to be. Now, a lot of people might say this. I've heard this a lot, and I want to deal with this real quick. Everybody's, there's, a, there's this sermon going around, this topic that says, well, wait a minute, once you're in God, you start changing, and that's just not true. There, there is an aspect of who you are that changes, so your spirit changes. The Bible says you were made new, you're a new creature in Christ, you've been born again. Your spirit changes, but your actions don't change right away. How do I know this? Because agapeo was taken from the Old Testament. The Old Testament, they followed the law by loving God. That was their showing of love to the Father. And they did so without the filling of the Holy Spirit, without being born again. What does that tell me? That means that love through obedience or agapeo is still the same today. It means that we can still operate. We still make the choice to choose. Now, it's so interesting because as we're going to go through this, you're going to start to see... I'm going I'm to shift some perspectives for you guys. Because the doctrines today talk about a love that requires nothing from you. The, 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 the doctrine of the church says love. God doesn't require anything of you for his love. And, and that's, that's the problem is when you teach that, you're leading people straight to hell. Because God does require something of you from, for your love, for his love. He, the, the Jesus says that if you obey me, I will love you and my father in heaven will also love you. I, I believe that's John 14, 6. And it's one that we'll look at either, it might not be today, it'll be further on in the sermon. 
But there's so much in Scripture that talks about our love. So one of the things that's going to be important is that when we start talking about love, we're talking about digging up a foundation. You may hear some stuff today that's going to make you feel a little, uh, uh, it hurts. You know, you know why that hurts? The reason it hurts is because you have this belief. Uh, uh, anybody here ever grow up believing in Santa Claus? Okay, we got a couple. We got, a, got another one. What happened when, when you first learned Santa Claus wasn't real? It, it was grating on you. It was like, what? No. That can't be true. You, you fought against the idea. Why did you fight against the idea? Because when you have a foundational belief, you build your life around that foundation. And so when somebody comes around and challenges your foundation, we automatically and subconsciously take it personal. We take the truth personal and we think we're the failure because we've built everything we are on a truth that isn't right. And here's the thing. It doesn't mean you're a failure. It just means that you were off on your doctrine, on your foundations. Let me ask you, if you want a solid house, you need a strong foundation. Right now, I'm having foundation issues at my home. We're in the process of working through them. Can you imagine how silly it would be if I decided I want, if I was going to, rather than deal with the foundation, just make the house look real pretty? I'm just going to keep, I'm just going to keep putting lipstick and makeup on. It's, it's like putting lipstick on a pig, right? What, what you're doing is you're trying to make something that can't stand look pretty. But eventually over time, if the foundation isn't strong, what's above it will crumble. But we... We get angry when someone challenges our foundation. Now, let me tell you this. This is a normal thing. This is a normal reaction when you get angry when somebody challenges your foundation. Because the Bible says your flesh and your spirit are constantly at war. It's your flesh that is the part of you that creates a subconscious belief. It's in your flesh that that's there. Your spirit knows truths your flesh doesn't know. How do I know this? It's called your conscience. It's like you've done something wrong. You know it's wrong. You don't know why it's wrong, but you know it's wrong. That's your spirit confirming this is wrong. And then you have the choice to make. Am I going to live by my conscience? Or am I going to live by my flesh? And you see, when your foundation gets challenged, what you're doing is you're aligning your flesh with the spirit. This is why sometimes if you listen to preachers online, you might listen and be like, oh, that doesn't feel good. One of two things is happening. They're challenging your foundation. So they're either going to challenge them for good or they're going to pull you away from God. This is where it gets confusing. This is why you need this. Okay? Whenever building a foundation, this is the foundation you build upon. Jesus says that he is the cornerstone. The cornerstone is the first stone placed in a home, and every stone is built around it. So if you, and if Jesus is the word made flesh, we talked about that recently, if you want to have Jesus as the cornerstone in your life, this has to be what creates your foundation, not your feelings, not your ideas, not your upbringing, not your denomination, not, not your background, not your culture, not what the world says is okay. Okay. We've created a culture in North America full of noodle men. And that's I've, I'm going to be using that term. If you, if you want to know what noodle men is, noodle men is weak, wimpy men who don't do anything or accomplish anything for the kingdom of God. They are essentially useless human beings on this planet. We are full of noodle men. Because they're not being productive, they're not teaching, they're not training, they're not leading, they're not living, they're not loving, they're not doing what God called them to do, and therefore, the only thing they're good for is to be put on a pasta and consume. <laughs> the only, if you are a noodle, we don't have any noodle men in this church, but the only place we have for noodles in this church is on the buffet every, every uh, fourth Sunday every last Sunday of the month. That's the only place I want to see noodles in this church. Otherwise, we want to see really good, strong, disciplined men who love and fear God above all else. Because that's love. That is love to, to, to each other. That is love to the world. Jeremiah, I, I don't know about that. We're going to get into it right away. So I want to start off at 1 Corinthians 13, 4-8. So what is love is the topic of today's, of today's sermon. So 1 Corinthians 13, uh, verses 4 through 8. 
So love suffering long and is, uh, this is the wrong translation. <laughs> it's okay. I am not a fan of the King James. <laughs> sorry for all of you. I'm not actually sorry if that offended you. If that offended you, uh, just deal with it. I'm going to go there. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 8. I'm going to read from my Bible. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. Love does not brag. It is not arrogant. But it does, not, er, it does not act disgracefully. It does not seek its own benefit. It is not provoked. It does not keep an account of wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness. I'm going to keep reading. But rejoices with the truth. I'm going to keep reading. Verse 7. It keeps every confidence. It believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away with. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away with. If you keep reading, it says all of those things will go away, but eventually what remains is love. So this is an interesting scripture. Anybody here ever read this, heard this, kind of looked through this? Lots of people look at it and they're like, whoa, I love this definition of love. I do too. I think it's a great definition of love. Who here remembers what we talked about at our first sermon on love? How do we define love? How do we find out what anything in Scripture means? There's a few things we've got to look at. Okay, I'm going to go through them one more time. They're not on here, so I'm going to go through them really quick. Number one is biblical definitions. We need to look at the definition of love. We've done that. Okay. The word love here is agape. So it's defining the word agape. Now, number two is the context of the phrase. Okay? We need to look at what the context of what the passage there is talking about. Since this is love is patient, love is kind, it, it has this beautiful definition, but it's in the middle of a chapter. Okay, so all we did was read the definition of love. So what do we still need to do? We need to look at the context of the phrase. Next thing we need to do is we need to look at the context of Scripture as a whole. Okay, so while this is a beautiful description of love, it is not the only description of love. Okay? Can you imagine if we took God, for example, and we said, wait a minute, the Bible says God is my provider. That's all he is. Can you imagine if we said that? Nobody in German, well, wait a minute, he's also like... Uh, my healer. <laughs> He's also light. He's also pure. He's also holy. Well, no, my Bible said and defined him here as this. Nobody would do that, right? Why do we do it with love? This is a beautiful definition of love, but it is not the only definition of love. Something to keep in mind. And then the last thing is everything has to line up. So, and again, if you are experiencing contradictions in Scripture, it's not a problem with Scripture, it's a problem with your understanding of it. Because everything in Scripture lines up, everything from God's Word is true. But the Bible says that every word that comes out of the, word of, of the mouth of God is good for edification, encouragement, and teaching. We have a responsibility to have a standard. If you aren't going to take the Word of God as the standard, you might as well not even be a Christian. Because without this as a standard, you have no standard, or you become the standard. And if you become the standard, it's no longer about you. God's no longer sitting on the throne of your heart. Now, the throne of, sitting on the throne of your heart is not a biblical term. It's a church culture term. It just simply means that God is ruling. He's the one who decides your, your steps. He's the one who moves you where you need to move and you get to decide whether or not you're going to make him Lord by listening or make Satan Lord by obeying him. So those are the four things that we need to look at. So we just op we went through 1 Corinthians 13, 4, 8. Keep your Bibles open there because we're going to go through this one by one and I, I want to break some things down for you. We're going to look at these words and we're going to break them down so that we have a good understanding of them. Because I've heard people quote this. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 to 8. And they come, Jeremiah, you're not this and this, and therefore you're not in love. Well, hold on. Let's look at the context of what we're talking about. When somebody comes to you and says, you're not in love, you need to prove that case in Scripture. So let's go there. First one. Uh, we're going to start at verse 4. 
Love is patient. Who here knows what the word patient means? If you had to define patient, most, most often people would be like, well, you're just waiting for something. Right? You're just waiting for something to come. You know how the Bible defines patient here? Perseverance. Long-suffering. You see, this is where the human language tends to get a little off. And the beautiful part of this is look at Jesus for a moment. We're going to contrast this a lot with Jesus. Jesus sat in the garden before he was about to be crucified, did not want to go. And everybody's like, well, Jeremiah, of course he wanted to go. He's God. He did not want to go. It was not his will to go. It was the Father's will to go. Jesus confirms this. Not my will, but your will be done implying Jesus did not want to go to the cross, but the Father required it of him, and Jesus obeyed. So this word patience here, it does not mean that you're sitting waiting patiently like you're waiting to go into the doctor's office. It means long-suffering. So love, first and foremost, is, it, it, it takes the form of perseverance. So if you think love is this easy going, lovey dovey, da 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 da, this first word should immediately eliminate that from it. Love is going to be hard enough that you have to persevere through it. And here's the thing if you don't have perseverance in you, you don't have love in you. This is an interesting concept. What does the Bible, we're, actually, we're going to keep reading through because the context of all of this is going to change your mind. I promise you, this will redefine some things for you this morning looking at this in context. So patience equals perseverance and suffering long. Okay? We're going to keep reading. What's the next one? The next one is kind. Now, everybody likes to call kindness niceness. Okay? There is a big difference between kindness and niceness. If you only want to know the in-depth difference of those, Hannah preached on it probably two years ago when we talked about the gifts of the or the gifts or the fruits of the spirit, how we have the gift of kindness and it's counterfeit niceness. Okay, so niceness is a counterfeit, which means it looks like the real thing, smells like the real thing, feels like the real thing, but has no value. you would not be able to take niceness to the bank and cash in for anything good. Being nice never got anyone saved. Kindness does that. So what is kindness? Kindness, service to others, really, really simple. Um, kindness is simply doing that which is best for the other person over what's best for yourself. Okay? Okay. This may seem like a really simple concept. Lots of people like to say, oh, I do that. I gave my coat. Okay, but did you tell them the truth? Okay, but did you stand for righteousness? Do you care about your brother enough to be like, hey, you know what? If you don't change, you're going to hell. So let me tell you the truth about it. That's actually kindness, guys. It means I care more about you than how you're going to react to me. All right, so we got patience, we got kindness. I don't need to spend too much time there. We've looked at those before. Um, love is not jealous. Ooh, the word here is envious. So it means it, it's not jealous, it's not eager to possess or eager for something or to set one's heart on. What does that mean? It means that if you have love on the inside of you, you're not looking at what everybody else has and being like, I wish I had that. Well, why is that guy making more money than me? Why does that guy have a bigger house than me? Why does this guy drive a nicer car than me? Why aren't I getting everything I want because I'm a Christian and I'm throwing a hissy fit? Jesus was homeless. Paul learned how to live with lots and he learned how to live with little. I'm not saying as a Christian you need to be poor. I'm saying as a Christian, no thing should hold your heart. You can be wealthy, but if that wealth is your God rather than God, you're in trouble. As a matter of fact, Proverbs, there's a, in Proverbs it says, Give me not too much wealth that I would forget who my God is, but give me enough so that I would not have to steal and profane the name of my God. This is King Solomon, the richest man ever to exist on the planet. He's worth more than all of the Apple company combined. And then some. It's some like, I think it's like some trillion dollars. It's insane what he was worth. And you know what he's saying? Give me just what I need. 
so that I don't forget who you are and so that I don't profane your name by needing to steal. I, there's a lot of wisdom in those words. God, I need the Camaro. No, you don't need the Camaro. You just need to get to work. So love is not jealous. It's not longing for. Your heart isn't attached to something other than God. You know who's allowed to be jealous? God. You know why God is jealous? Be- he, he's jealous for you because our hearts belong to something else and he does not want that. He is a jealous God who wants you to be his focus. You know what? If Hannah doesn't do this, but if Hannah had a habit of flirting with other guys, I would be jealous. I would be very jealous. And, if, and you know what's funny is if Hannah, Hannah would never do anything, but if Hannah ever did anything, I pity the guy. Because if I ever found him, it'd be a bad day. Well, Jeremiah, what, what about her? No, no, no. Men are leaders. I'm going to hold men accountable to men. Because there's this righteous jealousy. There's this righteous jealousy that God has for us. But when we're jealous for other things, we're taking our priority off God and now God's jealous for you. Because you know what? As a married man, I can tell you the value of knowing your wife wants you. When, when you walk into a room and you know your wife, your wife looks for you, catches your eye, and is keeping an eye on where you are because they want to know where you are at all times, not because they're controlling, but because they love you. I always know where my wife is. If we're out somewhere, I always know where she is so that if I need to help her, I'm there. I know where she is so that if, if there's anything going on, where's my wife? We had fireworks blow past our face, not that like last year. Literally, two feet from our face. Hannah went one way, I went to the other. We ran to cover. My first thing is, where's my wife? Why is that? Because that's where your focus is. That's where your priority is. Now, can you imagine if we lived this way for God? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm on rep to do this big home rental. I want to put $50,000 in. You know how often I've moved in my life without asking God first? You know, it's funny because God often looks at me and says, yeah, you know what you need to know. You're smart enough to know what I think about debt. Okay. You're right. But then sometimes, you know, you know, what we have to do is keep God in our preference. Debt isn't a sin. And you know what? There's actually lots of things in, you know, slavery was created for the purposes of debt in in the New Testament. I think we would be way better off today if we had slavery rather than debt. You know why? Because biblical slavery, after seven years, your debt was erased. Gone. No more 25-year mortgages. No more claiming bankruptcy. You go and serve the person you owe for seven years, and at seven years, you walk away debt-free. That sounds like a good deal to me. And there were laws protecting you as a slave. The master had to treat you well. They had to feed you. They had to educate you. They had to give you a home. This sounds pretty darn good. But there, it, was still wasn't, it still wasn't ideal because God wanted you to steward. But jealousy can put us into a place, longing for something puts us into a place where we're no longer stewarding ourselves properly. Hannah and I are doing a reno because our house is falling apart. <laughs> it's literally fa- I can't close certain doors in my home because it's sinking. So you know what? We have to go in debt so that our house doesn't die. But that's different than doing a reno that we can't afford so that we look good on the block. See, one is practical, it's of the heart, and it considered God first. One is not. Do you consider God in everything? Because if not, God will be jealous of you. It says this. He's a jealous God. He don't want to share his people with the world. Especially considered, if you're a Christian in this room, you're considered the bride of Christ. You should remember that before you do anything. Would my, would, would my groom want me doing this? It's a different thought. All right. 
let's keep reading. Uh, we went through uh, jealousy. Uh, what's, where are we? First Corinthians. Love does not brag. <laughs> I, I like this one. Because this is one of the ones that you really have to take in, in context with the rest of Scripture. Anybody here ever heard the Bible verse, I will boast in the Lord my God, but I will not boast in my own mind, my own strength, my own abilities, but I will boast where? In the Lord my God. So we're talking about I will not brag. Do you know what the word brag here means? It means boastful. It means vaunting yourself or needing attention. This stems from a position of severe insecurity so that you are requiring everybody looks at you. Anybody ever met one of those people? You know that that's the definition of the opposite of love. If you, don't ha if you are this, you have no love in you. Jeremiah, you're setting the, the standard of love really high. No, I'm just defining it for you and you can do with it as you please. This is the scripture's version of love. This is why the shed blood of Jesus paid for you because this is not something any human being starts out as. You can't get here without God. You can have a semblance of love, but you can't have actual love without knowing the Father. It's a beautiful thing. So we've got boastful, don't vaunt, don't, don't need the attention. If somebody else is talking, then they're midway through a conversation and you change the conversation because you're bored, that is the definition of, of, of what we're talking about here, boastful. Because it's all about you. I was at a board meeting once where I was having a discussion and the whole board was having a, a meeting. And some guy pops up and changes the conversation. And I'm like, we're not done with this. He's like, yeah, well, I'm done. And I said, okay, buddy. This world does not revolve around you. You're being arrogant right now. You need to stop. Because we're not done having this conversation. There was a public calling him out. Blah, 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 blah. He was like, oh. somebody actually said something. We finished our conversation. It went on normally. Two weeks later, that guy comes up to me. And we are like, we are better friends now than we were before. Why? Because true love cares more about how they look than how I look. True love cares more about how they act than, and how we can help them become better than how I look. And the fruit of it is people start to respect you. You don't go to, the, you don't go to somebody who's schmoozing you if you need help. You go there when you want affirmation. You go to the one who's going to call it like it is when you need help because you know that you're going to get a truthful response from them. Who do you want to be? If you constantly require affirmation from man, your focus is in the wrong place because all you need is affirmation from God. Is it easy to get there? Not at all. It is not easy to look at people and be like, I really don't care what you think. But I can tell you, as somebody who is getting there, it does happen. You can get to the point where you just don't care what people think. It's actually not a bad thing if you're talking about living righteously and you don't care that they think you're living too righteously. What you should care about, and this is another part of love, is that you don't misrepresent God. If the world hates you because you're acting like them, you have a problem. If they hate you because you're not acting like them, you're in a good spot. So we got boastful. keep going it is not brag which is boastful and then we've got it is not arrogant arrogant proud what is arrogance arrogance is the opposite of humility and what is humility humility is knowing who you are in God okay if you are a king and you act like a pauper that's not humility that's pride that's arrogance. Why? Because when you are something, when God looks at you and says, you're this, and you look up at God and say, yeah, I don't think so. Who's arrogant in that picture? You are. And you know what? That can go both ways. You can think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, and it's called pride. You can also think lesser of yourself than you ought to think. Also pride. Well, Jeremiah, how is thinking less of yourself pride? Because what you're doing is saying it doesn't matter what God says about me. I'm trumping it with my feelings of myself. That's pride. 
So when you think too little of yourself or you think too highly of yourself, you're walking in pride. You need to walk the way God says you are. You are a prince. You are a king's kid. You are somebody who goes out and shares light and salt with the world. You have an inheritance with Jesus himself. All of heaven is going to be partly yours because of your marriage to Christ. And you act like a little wiener schnitzel sitting in the corner doing nothing with your life because you don't think you're good enough pride arrogance no love in you told you i'm going to step on some toes today <laughs> arrogance is is this position that you're better than god and better than everyone else here's the beautiful part if you're walking in humility you'll never think of yourself as higher in value than any other human being because you fully understand that the only reason you're standing here today with who you are is because Jesus paid the price. When you understand that no man is good, no man is holy, no man is capable of doing anything without the bloodshed from Jesus, you can't look at any other person in the room and think you have more value than they do. You can't. If you do, you don't understand what Jesus did for you. What isn't arrogance is knowing what you're capable of. Can you imagine if you went to a doctor? And the doctor, you're like, doctor, I'm not feeling good. I got this terrible pain in my stomach. I just feel sick all the time. And your doctor looked at you and was like, oh, I don't know. I... I'm just, a, I'm just a guy who doesn't really know what he's talking about. Uh, didn't you go to eight years of school? Well, well yeah, but I, I need to be humble right now, so I don't really, really want to diagnose what you have. Here, here's some stuff to make the pain go away. Would you ever go back to that doctor? Or would you appreciate it if that doctor looked at you and said, yeah, here's my education, here's what you have, here's the list of symptoms, here's what it most likely is, so here's a solution to the problem, and then we'll come back and look at it. Which one makes more sense? The second one. So why do we get mad at people who are in the church, have been there longer, are probably a little more wise, are a little more prayed up, and they say that and you think they're arrogant? You should be able to recognize where you sit as far as your own maturity in the kingdom of God. And you know what? There are people more mature than you, and there are people less mature than you. It is not arrogant to know where you sit in there, because that will determine who you get advice from. I would not send a sick person to my nephew for a diagnosis. Why? Because Isaac would be like, oh, candy. That'll make your tummy feel better. That's what baby Christians do. Oh, you're in sin? Don't worry. God don't care about your sin. He just loves you. Candy, it leads to death. You need maturity in Christians. So one of the ways that you cannot be arrogant is to know exactly who you are. Exactly who you are. Moses was considered the meekest man. The word meek there is also the word for humility. He was considered the meekest man. He went up to Pharaoh and said, let my people go. Does that sound wimpy to you? He walked up to the most powerful man on the planet and said, if you don't let them go, my God's going to kick your butt. Why? Because meekness isn't about your status. It's about you lining up with where God's calling is. You know why Aaron was considered arrogant? Because he was called to be here. Moses was called to be here, but Aaron wanted to be with Moses. He wanted to be higher than his calling. And because of that, there was arrogance. And that led to some problems for Aaron, if you go and read that story. Aaron and Miriam got judged for how they treated Moses. It wasn't that they wanted position. It was that they wanted a position they weren't called to. I'm setting some stages for you guys today. 
let's keep going. We looked up at we looked at puffed up. We looked at arrogant. Remember, we're talking about what love is. So all of these things that are negative are what love isn't and should be. So if you have this arrogance in you, that means that you need to change it so that love can be present. Love produces boldness because if you knew who you were, you would be like David standing in front of Goliath and be like, how dare you insult my people? Do you know who they are? Do you know who my God is? Was he arrogant to say that? No, he was humble because he knew it was about God. <laughs> oh, I'm this. Sorry, this is so good. I'm just so happy about this. Let's pop over to 1 Corinthians 4.18 for a moment while we're on arrogance. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 18. And we're going to read from there all the way to 5.2. Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. Here we go. I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. Who's talking? Paul. Does that sound arrogant to you? <laughs> a little bit. You're all like, yeah, that sounds a little arrogant. We're going to keep reading. <laughs> Let me tell you this. Paul was not an arrogant man. Nevertheless, in church, I speak, I prefer to speak five words with my mind so that I may instruct others also rather than 10,000 words in a tongue. What's he doing? He's establishing his priorities. It's better that I teach people with five words than pray in tongue with 10,000. He's saying, I would rather see people come to understand what I understand. Does that sound like arrogance or humility? So here's the thing. It starts off with what one would perceive as an arrogant statement, followed up by the justification and the reason for it, which now brings it out of pride and into humility. Ah, keep reading. Brothers and sisters, do not be children in your thinking, yet, sorry, no. No, we're going to stop. It's verse 18. That's all I wanted to see. Th thank you, God, I speak more in tongues than you all. We're going to read the rest of that a little bit later, possibly. We'll see if we get there. I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. And now let's go over to chapter 5, verse 2, and we're going to read that. And it says, by which you also are saved if you hold firmly to the word which I preach to you unless you believed in vain. He's saying, if you don't hold to what I preach to you, you're going to be in trouble. Does that sound arrogant? I preached it. you got to live it or you're in trouble. Can you imagine what would happen today if a pastor walked, like you guys might be used to some of this here, but can you imagine in most churches if a pastor walked up and said, I'm preaching the gospel, and if you don't live it, you're not going to heaven. How many churches would go from 100 to zero really, really fast? Actually, maybe like five. You would preach down the size of a church rather quickly if you started preaching from a position of authority. Authority, lived authority that you actually have is one of the most humble positions you can walk in. A husband who treats his wife properly is humble. A husband who treats his wife improperly is arrogant and there's no love present in him. A wife who treats her husband the way God intends it is humble. A wife who is nagging and irritating and not following the way God wants her to do is not humble, but, is, but prideful. Okay? It, we have a lot of things in our lives that the world will call arrogant. I recently had a conversation with somebody, and they're like, well, what makes your interpretation of Scripture more accurate than mine? I said, well, mine's based on Scripture. Yours is based on feelings. And they're like, well, so what? You're, you're discounting my years and years and years of experience? I said, it doesn't matter how much experience you have. It really, really doesn't. What, what matters is, is the wisdom of God that's inside of you in the Scripture. Because here's the thing about experience. If you've been doing something for 30 years, you have 30 years of experience doing it that way. But what if you've been doing it wrong for 30 years? All you've got is 30 years of experience doing it the wrong way. What good is that? 
Wisdom, true wisdom, if you look anywhere in Scripture, doesn't come from man, doesn't come from age, doesn't come from other people. It comes from God alone. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, ask who? God. So where does wisdom come from? God. It does not come from man. If a man looks at you and says, you know what? I've been in this ministry for 40 years. How dare you contradict me? It said, that doesn't matter. This Bible's been around for 2,000 years. Get off your high horse. You need to be willing to have that mentality. This has to be the standard. And if not, you're in arrogance. If you look at this and say, you know what? I just can't. I don't feel like this scripture is right because it goes against how I feel. That's arrogance. That's not humility. I didn't intend to spend so much time on, uh, on, on arrogance. But yeah, so the 1 Corinthians 4.18 and the 1 Corinthians 5.2 are both examples of what you might think looks arrogant. And in, in today's society, if you said those, you might get called arrogant. But it's important to remember, as long as you're walking where God intends you to walk, it's not arrogant, it's humility. But if you think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, that's where you start into, into pride. Or lower than you ought to think. Where does it say that in Scripture, Jeremiah? Well, have a look at the, the parable of the talents. The guy who was given one did not think of himself highly enough to invest the one. He took what we would call in today's church the humble approach. He said, well, wait a minute. If I, if I just don't do anything, I don't make anybody angry. I just sit here and be useless. I won't make anyone mad. What did, what did the master do? He came back to the guy with the one talent and said, you wicked and evil servant, you did nothing with which I gave you. Now I'm casting you out and I'm giving what you had to the rich guy. You see, the kingdom of God works a little differently. Very, very differently. We'll talk about money another time. Let's go on to the next one. Which means we're going back to uh, 1 Corinthians 13. And we're going to keep going to number five. It does not act disgracefully. Okay, what does that mean? It means to act or behave improperly. Who creates the standard of what's proper in church and what's not proper in church? God does. God does, okay? He's the one who sets the standard. There are certain behaviors you can do in church. You cannot come to church and have sex on the front steps, okay? That is not proper. The reason I bring that up is because in Ephesus, that was a thing. They had, in, in Ephesus, they had what was called their goddess. It was run by a goddess, and that goddess was like the sex goddess. Okay? And so having sex in the streets was considered your worship to this goddess. Who considers what's proper? God does. So when you come to church, there's a certain way to act and behave. There's, there's a, in, in Scripture, it talks about while the preacher's preaching, you don't interrupt. Why is that? Because other people want to be able to hear what you have to say. It's not about you. If you have questions, come later. Okay? There are certain ways to do things, and God designed them this way for a reason. The reason is he's a God of order. He's a God of justice. And when you don't do these things, when you aren't orderly and proper, there's no love on the inside of you. Because the love is the value for what God created. Jeremiah, it sounds like you're reading off a bunch of rules and you're making this love thing really hard. It is hard. Okay? Love is hard. <laughs> Jesus died on the cross for love. It's not easy, but it's worth it. It has an eternal reward that far outweighs any whatever reward you're going to get here on earth. I would, you remember the scripture? Everybody here ever heard the song, It Better Is One Day Than a Thousand Elsewhere? I would rather be in a place where, where, where it would be said of that place that one day there is better than a thousand here and you get eternity there. Wow. How do you get that? You love. You've got to understand love. Okay, so we talked about that. It's, it doesn't act disgracefully or behave improperly. It doesn't seek its own 
uh, where are we? It does not seek its own benefit. We're going to go right back into a very similar thing that we talked about earlier. Okay, but not seeking your own, uh, not seeking your own benefit. Where are we? I lost it. Is selfish ambition. Now we're going really far into it. So selfish ambition is what you do in order to benefit you rather than benefit the kingdom. I think one of the biggest reasons the church today has issues with authority is because of this one. We take issue with authority because in the past, church leaders have taken that authority and used it for selfish ambition rather than for love. And then so you get things like abuse. Here's what's wrong with this. is God said that having authority is good. That's part of proper order. So if you try to say it's not good because abuse exists, you have no love in you. But what does that mean? It just means that we need to do authority right. It means authority isn't interested in oneself. It can't be about you. It can't be about your own preferences. It can't be about what you're trying to teach. You should find somebody who's an authority in your life that takes their role as that authority seriously. How awful would you feel if you called the police because someone's breaking into your house and found out that the guy breaking into your house has that police officer on his payroll? That police officer shows up and says, yeah, I can't do much about it. This guy can do whatever he wants. What would you think of that authority? Zilch. Does that mean that you throw away police officers in general? Not at all. It means that the higher authority deals with bad authority. And in today's day and age, the world has tried to do that in their own ways. But I tell you, there are parameters in place for spiritual authority that if they, I, anybody in spiritual authority steps out of that role and into selfishness, God deals with you way more harshly than he does everybody else. And that should scare you. There's a reason that uh, I think it was Paul that said it, you shouldn't desire to be a teacher because if you're a teacher, you're going to get judged way more harshly than everybody else. Being a teacher is not just sitting center stage, getting all of the everybody looking at you. Being a teacher is what I say and they do, I become accountable for because I said it. If I stood up here and started doing false prophecies to everybody and said, if you give away all your money to me, God will give you a bigger house. If I said that to you and you went out and did it, you know who's responsible? Me. I don't want to be that guy. Okay? So it's not selfish. It's not self-seeking. It doesn't have its own intention in mind. For you guys, for, for if you're not in leadership, this goes for everything. Let me, let me ask you a very simple question. You're having a conversation with somebody. They say something that is, is hurtful to themselves. So it's like, oh, it's just a little white lie. You now have the opportunity to look in and you say, wait a minute, but a little white lie can damage the relationship we have. Because now how do I know you're not telling me white lies? But what do you do? Now you're faced with a decision. Do I confront my friend who just told me they're okay with lying? Or do I keep my mouth shut? Which one do you think is more selfish an action? Not saying anything. Huh. So you're telling me by keeping my mouth shut, I have no love in me. Huh. Change of perspective. Let's keep reading. We're not done yet. It does not act disgracefully. It does not seek its own benefit. Next one. It is not provoked. <laughs> This one's fun. And uh, it's really easy to test. I'm really good at pushing this button. I, I, I don't often brag, but this is something I'm really good at. I love pushing buttons because I can tell how quickly somebody can get angry or not. If you are quick to anger, there's no love on the inside of you. I've had conversations with people in this city. People I considered friends, people I looked to as companions, people that I trusted with certain kinds of information. I had conversations with them about scripture where we had to bring some things back into alignment and within a five minute conversation, they hated me and left the room. 
Some of these men are pastors. Some of these men are leaders. Some of these men are board members. Here's the problem with this. If you're quick to anger, there's no love inside of you. Not easily provoked means that when somebody comes and confronts you, you don't get angry. Well, Jeremiah, that seems really hard to do. It does if your foundation is built upon something that says get angry and you feel justified in doing so. I'm going to ask you guys this personal question. Have any of you ever seen me get really, really angry with someone? So much so I'm red in the face, I'm ready to hate them, and I don't think anybody here has ever seen that. Because I don't remember ever being there. Why is, I'm not doing that to brag, I'm doing that to prove a point. Anybody can feel comfortable approaching you if you're not quick to anger. How likely are you to go to someone for advice if you know if you say the wrong thing, they're going to flip out at you? You're not. You, you're going to think, okay, I, I, can, I feel safe coming to you with everything we agree on, but if we don't agree, I can't approach you because you might bite my head off. I had a church leader like that once. If we agreed, we were good. If we disagreed, I could not approach him because he got angry with me. You, that is not loving. Loving is the discussion. You know what? You should be able to have anybody come up to you and be like, I'm accusing you of this and this and this and this. And like, okay. Well, let's have a discussion about that. Where's your, well, let, let's treat this like the Bible says we do. Where, where's your evidence? Did I actually do these things? Because I can tell you I didn't do these things. And you know what that does is that diffuses the situation. Why? Because now you're not responding to anger with anger. You're responding to anger with what the Bible calls love. Being cool and level-headed is love. I had a guy come up to me while I was working on a roof once. And he pulls out this knife. He walks up to me and he says, I just found out somebody's been cheating on my wife. Cheating, with, like, cheating on my wife with me. They've been having sex with my wife. There we go. That's what it is. And I'm like, oh, that's not good. He says, I'm going to go kill the person that did it. <laughs> and I'm like, well, that's probably not a good idea. And that person is you. Looked at me with a knife in his hand. Said, that person is you. I said, man, I don't even know your wife. I, I've never met you. <laughs> I've never had sex with your wife at all. He's like, yeah, I have a private investigator. I'm like, well, I'd like to see the pictures. You say he's got pictures. Let's see them. Let's see your evidence, and we can go through this. Well, no, no, no. You, you did this. And no, I didn't do this. But I'm happy to have the conversation with you. If you think this is happening, obviously there's something going on. And we were able to have this discussion that eventually the man put his knife away and just went back to work. He was an employee of mine. But you know what would have happened if I had responded with anger? Be like, how dare you pull a knife on me? We would have had a fight. And it wouldn't have ended well for either of us. One of us was getting hurt that day if I would have responded with anger. Who do we want to be? Because when we look like Christ, we can now respond in a way that the world doesn't understand, but it produces something far more powerful than being able to grab that man and flip him around. Now, could I, I could have fought this guy. He was not that big. He was a tiny little fella. And at that point, I was lifting things well over 300 pounds by myself. We were flipping big rolls. We were very, very strong. This guy was nothing. But what was more important? Was it showing who I am? Or was it showing who God is? What was beautiful is that after that guy walked away, four other crew members came up to me and said, if they'd have jumped you, I'd have killed them. <laughs> I had so much of my crew ready to pound this guy. I said, no, 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 that's not necessary. He's back to work. And you know what happened? Everybody went back to work. And that guy to this day, if he sees me, will come up and shake my hand and say hello. We have relationships still. I'm not, this isn't about bragging. This is to show you slow to anger produces something different in the world because you're confronting them with the love of God, something they don't experience otherwise. You want to know how to love the world? This is a beautiful picture. But you notice how we love the world has nothing to do with the world. It has everything to do with you. Because if you're slow to anger, everything you do loves the world. If you're not selfish, 
Everything you do loves the world. Why? Because it's in you. It comes out of you. Let's keep reading. It's not, so it's not provoked, which means aroused, anger, stimulated, getting angry really, really quickly. So it does not seek its own benefit. It is not provoked. It does not keep an account of a wrong suffered. What does that mean? Let me give you a really good example of it. It does not mean that all of a sudden you fully extend trust again. One of the things my wife and I have is we have these little quirks. Okay, There's some things I do that just irritate her. It's not like I'm trying to be irritating. I just live my life and sometimes it's annoying. Okay, That just happens. There's some things with her. She just lives her life and those things are annoying. There are ways, there are battles you fight because they, they represent who we are to Christ and there are battles you don't fight because it don't matter. Okay, So not keeping account of wrong would be the equivalent of me looking at those little irritating things that my wife does and being like, I'm not going to let that bother me or affect how I treat you. I'm not going to let the things that I consider distasteful affect how I treat you. Another good example of this is, let's say you have, two, you have a friend, a really good friend, they hurt you, they lie to your face, they break your trust. For me, lying is one of the biggest things. If you spend any time working with me, if you lie to me, that's like the worst thing you can do. I don't care if you punch me, I don't care if you do all those things, but if you lie to me, my relationship to you gets really, really hard to maintain. Because if I can't trust you, we can't be friends. So one of the things that I, they lie to you, da, 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 they come back, I'm sorry. I acknowledge that I lied. I did this thing wrong. Please forgive me. I promise I will not lie to you again. Here's, how, here's what love does. Okay, I'll forgive you. I will give you back the trust you broke. But here's the condition. You break it again, I'm not giving you back that same level of trust. But if they do maintain, if they do what they said they're going to do, the next time they tell me something, you know what I can't do? I can't be like, well, he lied to me that one time, so is he telling me the truth? If you're going to say, I forgive you, and I'm re-extending trust, you have to tell yourself in that moment, I will not remember what you did to me before. This is one of the reasons it's so hard for people to grow. There was a point in my life where I was really, 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 really angry. I've told you guys this. I got angry a lot. When I started changing, the people around me didn't know what to do with it. Because when I responded without anger, the assumption was he's going to get angry still. Why? Because I grew, but they didn't see me grow. This is what's called giving the benefit of the doubt in today's day and age. When somebody is changing, you have to be willing to acknowledge that change. If you knew someone as a liar and they said, I don't lie anymore, you have to start treating them this way. This is love until they break your trust. But when you do that, it, what, it, what it means is I don't keep account of wrongs anymore. It means you're quick and easy to forgive and you don't bring up past mistakes to beat somebody who's repentant in front of you over the head. Can you imagine what would happen if my wife came to me to apologize for something she did and I brought up like eight things that she did in the past that hurt me? You think that's conducive to the relationship growing? No. You know why? Because I'm taking into account everything she did wrong in the past and not dealing with what's right in front of me. If I want God to treat me in such a way that my sins are forgiven, I need to do the same thing with those around me. This is important. This is love. Next one. <laughs> it's so quiet in here. It does not keep an account of wrong suffering. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. My goodness, this is one that I wish we did better at as a church. Not, not this church. I know you guys, you, guys, you guys, I'm sure don't do this. If you do, we'll probably end up having a conversation at some point. But you do not rejoice at wickedness. You should not be excited someone had an abortion. You should not be excited someone lied, cheated, stole. You don't, I, I got convicted of this a while back. <laughs> and this might convict some of you. And that's okay. Just change your perspective. 
I watched a movie called Ocean's Eleven. Ocean's Eleven is essentially about all these guys, and they rob this really rich dude who owns a casino. And in the movie, they portray these guys as like the heroes or these really good guys. Look, they're stealing from a bad guy, da 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 da. Or, you, or another one maybe everyone has seen is Robin Hood. But you know what happens is, is that story is glorifying and we rejoice at evil action. When that, when that hit me, I thought, oh my goodness. I, was, I wanted to grow up and be a robber because of Ocean's Eleven. I was like, that is such a cool job. And then I grew up and God was like, wait a minute, you're not supposed to rejoice at evil. Stealing something that's not yours is evil. And yet I rejoiced at it so much so that I wanted to be like it. How often do we do this? How often do we look at what's evil and think, way to go, man. Well done. And we rejoice at it. And then how often do we get angry when something good gets done? When we accomplish something right. There's, there's this video, that, this movie that was out here. I'm, I'm picking on movies because movies is what today's culture often associates as the standard by which we're supposed to live. I've actually had conversations with people where I'm asking them to prove something, and they say, well, this movie has it. I'm like, that's not evidence. Movie is entertainment. It's not fact. Oh, right, I forgot about that. But sometimes we look at movies as a standard, and in this movie, this guy cheated on his wife. Not good. Goes and gets married to this new, to this new guy, after he, or to this new girl, after he cheated. And everybody's like, yeah, you got a good girl. Way to go. Because this other girl had some issues. I'm like, well, what? You, she had a few issues. You cheated. You left. You got remarried. And everybody's celebrating you, not her. And then she gets married again and everybody's grumpy about it. Well, I, that lady just, rather than looking and dealing with the actual issue is I'm giving you some examples that are pointing things out. What we rejoice at and what we scoff at are reflections of our values. Do I value what God says I should value or do I value what the world says I should value? If I value what God says I should value, which means, what does this say here? I'm going to read it word for word. It means that it does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It rejoices with the truth. I'm going to say it again. It rejoices with the truth. That's love. What is the truth? You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. Do not commit adultery. Do not fornicate. Do not get drunk. Do not do those things. Do not get excited about those things. Do not rejoice at those things. You should mourn those things. Those are consequences of broken people doing broken things to try and heal a brokenness inside of them that only God can heal. And as long as God's not present in their life, they will never get better. How am I supposed to love the world? Keep listening. We're, gonna, we're not done yet. I'm going to get through as quickly as I can. It does not rejoice. In, okay, verse 7. It keeps every confidence. Cover closely, bear with, endure patiently. What does that mean? It's a form of empathy. When it talks about covering, it means that in that moment, I am with you through this. What does the Bible say we're supposed to do in one's mourning? We mourn with them. That's part of a covering. It's saying, wait a minute, I, what does God do? Where are, we supposed to, where are we supposed to find comfort with God? What does the Bible say in the Old Testament? It says, under his wings. There's a covering. What does the Holy, what, is, what did the presence of God often do? It hovered above, implying it covered them. When you get anointed, what did the oil do? It covered you. Okay? Covering is a beautiful picture of letting the more powerful thing cover the less powerful thing to bring about safety, training, and understanding. It's also empowering. A mother who sees something dangerous coming covers her child. 
A husband who sees something dangerous coming covers the child and the wife. Why? Because the greater authority, the greater power covers the lesser power. And I'm sorry if it offends you, but men are more powerful than women physically. There's just no question about this. They're also in higher authority. If you're married, your husband is the greater authority. This is biblical. There's also greater, greater judgment for the one in higher authority if you're not while following God properly. So the covering is important. That's part of keeping confidence. It bears with and endures and, and, and covers and closely. Another, another example of what this is talking about is if somebody brings you something, because what are we supposed to do as Christians? We're supposed to confess our sins one to another. If somebody comes and says, look, I've been, screw- I've been doing this. I've been doing this wrong. I've screwed up. I've done these things that I'm not supposed to do. Here's my sin, please. I, I just need more of God. Okay, well, let's, let's pray together. You repent. I'll stand with you. And you know what it means to cover it up? It means, okay, you've repented it's done I will hold it against you no more but how easy is it to just say well that person did this and this and this and this and they're just a sinner what you need to look for is not the sin what you need to look for is the repentance if there's a lack of repentance you can see and acknowledge and call out the sin If there's no repentance, or if there is repentance, don't you dare keep casting judgment. Because if God forgave them, he also forgave you. Again, I will say this just to reiterate. Repentance and forgiveness is not always equal a re-extension of trust. Okay? They're not always the same thing. All right, let's keep reading. It keeps every confidence, which means that it covers closely. It believes all things. So believes all things means to entrust, have faith in, extend, or uh, entrusted with. What does that mean? It means that you have to be willing to trust other people with something that is yours. Oftentimes, that's our hearts. One of the reasons we don't share with people is we don't trust other people with our hearts. When I've done, I've done a fair bit of marriage coaching, when you do marriage coaching, one of the biggest problems is you have two spouses doing this with their hearts. My precious. And they don't share it with their spouse. You know how you're supposed to do marriage? Here's my heart. Here, Hannah. Hannah's my wife. You can have mine. Give me yours. Which means that my responsibility is to guard her heart. Her responsibility is to guard my heart. This is how it works with God. My responsibility is to guard his heart. His responsibility is to guard my heart. Who do you think does a better job of guarding each other's hearts? God does. Who's going to get the most hurt in this relationship? God is. He's bearing all things. It keeps every confidence, believes all things, it hopes all things. So believes all things means to trust. So hopes is expects, hopes, and, 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 and wishes the best of everything. I was in business. I had somebody, I'm not going to call any names out, but there was a point in business where, Jeremiah, why do you always entrust so much to everybody? Because part of loving is hoping all things. I'm going to extend trust to you until you prove me wrong. But Jeremiah, that just costs you everything. It costs Jesus everything to hope in me. I, I can't do any less. I actually had an uncle who told me once, Jeremiah, that's just naive. How dare you do that? I looked at him and I said, well, I have the love of God on the inside of my heart, which means that because he hopes all things in me, I need to reciprocate that to the world and to my brothers and sisters, which means that I don't care how vulnerable it makes me to be able to trust someone ahead of time. Unless I have a reason to distrust them, I should treat every single person as though they are a clean slate in front of me. And then I only hold them accountable to what is done towards me after that point. 
Because otherwise, how am I any different than the world? You know what the world does? They go, and they gossip into each other's ears. They gossip and they say things. And they say these other things. And you know what happens is people start gossiping and goes, and then now, now all of a sudden you've got this thing about gossip that's not true, blown up a thousand fold by the time it gets through a hundred people and everybody's talking about this gossip. You know, you know what gossip is? Gossip is when you hear something about someone and refuse to tell them. If I hear something about Annie and I don't go tell Annie what was said, I'm contributing to the gossip. You might think, well, if, I just, if it stops at me, that's good. No, 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 no. Because you've listened to it, but you're not letting the person about whom it's being spoken deal with the problem, which means you're still hurting them. If you hear something about someone, you're responsible for that information. When what you do biblically with that information is, hey, so-and-so is saying this about you. I want to know if it's true. Because I need to know so that I can tell the truth to people. If you don't do that, you're not walking in love. Why? And what does that do? That produces the inability to do what we just talked about. Which was, believes all things. If loves, believes all things, hopes for all things, or hopes all things, sorry. It hopes, expects, if you are allowing these things to be spoken, you are, you are essentially choking out any hope of that person being different. You're, you're choking out the ability for that person to come get healing, and you're choking out anything like that. You're incapable of doing this unless you're strong enough in yourself to look at that person and say, I don't care what I've heard about you. I'm going to go ahead and trust God, and I'm going to treat you the way God would have me treat you, which means we get a blank slate to start. It endures all things. Verse 8, love never fails. The word fail here means falls under or falls or, or screws up or does all of these things. It, it, it never, ever, ever falls. So this is a beautiful description of what love is, wouldn't you say? Did I change some perspectives for you? All right, let's change some more. I'm going to finish with this thought because I, I want to touch on this while I'm still here. That was the breakdown of that particular, of that particular area. So that was 1 Corinthians 13, uh, verses 4 to 8. We just broke it down. Now we look at the big picture. You guys ready for this? So 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 14. So the chapters before and after 1 Corinthians 13, what are they talking about? They are talking about gifts of the Spirit. So essentially what we have is a Holy Spirit sandwich, a gift of the Spirit sandwich. We got talking about the gifts of the Spirit in chapter 12. Here's all of the things that we're supposed to do, the use of them, how they work, da-da-da-da-da. And then we talk about love. And then we go on to verse four, or chapter 14, which talks about how of all of these gifts, prophecy is a superior gift. Now I want you to consider what this is talking about. We looked at the context of those verses. Now we're going to look at the context of the entire passage. What's the passage? When you're operating with the gifts of the Spirit, this is how you do it in love. <laughs> This isn't just talking about everyday Christian life. This is talking about when you're walking in power, when you're walking about the power of the Holy Spirit. This is how you live. Now I want you to consider something. Now I'm going to read this again. When you prophesy, it has to be done patiently, kindly, not boastful, not puffed up, not disgracefully, not seeking its own benefit, not easily provoked. And it keeps every confidence. It believes all things, hopes all things, and has faith in all things and never fails. That changes, the, changes how we see the gifts of the Spirit. How often do you see today prophetic words that are not done in love? Because they're self-centered. They're not lovers of the truth. If you hear a prophetic word that comes out of someone's mouth and it rejoices in unrighteousness, it does not, re and does not rejoice in righteousness. It's wrong. I heard somebody say, God told me to leave my spouse to be married to somebody else because I'll be happier. That's not a prophetic word because it's not from love. 
How many people have gone, well, I want to heal people. Why do you want to heal people? Is it so that they come into the kingdom or so that you look good? So many people want the gifts of the Spirit because of how it will make them look to everybody else rather than because it glorifies God. So 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians are talking about the gifts of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 13 is talking about who we're supposed to be while operating in these gifts. These are truly aspects of love, but not the fullness of it. There is more to love than just these things. And we will talk about that next week because we're getting late on time. What is love? These are, por- these are aspects of love, guys. But when we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13... And you have somebody come up and say, well, Jeremiah, or uh, maybe it's uh, Kelly, or uh, Annie, or Greg, you're, you're just not loving me properly. You can be like, well, wait a minute. Let's talk about what love is. What part do you think I'm not loving you in? Well, what you said was mean, and it hurt my feelings. Okay, well, maybe your feelings are put in the wrong place. I'm going to give you guys permission to do something that's completely countercultural. You can look at somebody and say, you might need to retrain your feelings. You may be feeling this, but you shouldn't be. (laughs) Because how you're feeling is a reflection of who you are on the inside. And if you're feeling insulted because somebody called you out on your sin, you're not a righteous person then. Because a righteous person, what does the Bible say about somebody who's wise? If you correct a wise person, he will be wiser still. If you correct a scoffer or somebody who's angry and hatred and all of these things, he will hate you. You want to know who you're talking to. Are they wise? Do they receive correction? Are they, do they get angry and, and quick to anger and get spoutful? You know what they are? They're fools. That's what the Bible says. And there's no love on the inside of them. This is how we're supposed to treat people. And so what you can do is, wait a minute, I understand you're feeling this way, but if you truly understood how God saw you, how he wants you to live, how he gave you purpose, a plan, and a vision, you'd be willing to accept correction because it brings you closer to the Father rather than away from the Father. And if your heart was truly after Him and not after your own benefits, any change in your life that can bring you closer to God would be something you desire with all your heart. Can you imagine seeking correction to the point because it brings you so close to God. I wish somebody had told me when I was younger, Jeremiah, you're off on your doctrine, so I didn't have to learn it all by myself. I wish. Now, my parents did a great job raising me. I grew up in a family that loved God. I grew up in a family that prayed regularly, so much so that I was able to do some things as a child that I probably shouldn't have done. We eat honey and sugar and all this stuff under the table while they're all praying because they're so in, in, in depth in their prayer with God that my sister and I are dipping our finger in honey and then into sugar and then eating it at about 10 o'clock at night while they're all praying. But I grew up loving God because they raised me loving God. It's funny because all the stuff that they said meant way less than what they did. This is how we're supposed to live. Out of who we are produces life in those that follow us. You want your kids to love God, you know what you do? You love God more than anything in the world, and your kids will pick up on that. This is how you do it. Amen? Thank you, God, for today. Thank you for your anointing. Thank you, God, that we still have so much to talk about in love, and yet we probably won't even touch, we won't even scratch the surface of it. But I thank you, Father, that you sent your Son to die on the cross for us. I thank you that you opened the door for us to be able to come into your presence and so that we could come boldly before your throne and that we could repent and that we could be covered because of what you did. I thank you, Father, for your word that teaches and trains us every single day and Holy Spirit, that you would never stop speaking to us. Lord God, I ask that you would renew in us the ability to feel conviction if we've lost it, Father. I ask that you would open our eyes for where where 
we've, where we've shut out the Holy Spirit in our lives, that we would open those doors up again so that we can come closer and closer to you and so that out of who we are, we represent you to the world. In Jesus' name, amen.